Well, we're in the book of Numbers, one of the books of the Torah. In the, in the uh, Greek, they call it the Pentateuch, but in the Hebrew, it's called the Torah, the five books of Moses. Clearly, one of the most venerated segments of the Bible throughout the world. And the book of Numbers covers a very crucial period of history. It's called the book of Numbers because it was called Numeri in Latin, and in, in the Greek they used the word numbers because there, it has several senses, censuses of the, uh, name of the people of Israel. That's not really the most relevant part of the book. It just happens to be the label that is now attached to it. In the Hebrew, it's Bemidbar, which is in the wilderness, and this is a far more descriptive title because it really covers 38 unnecessary years. 38 years that were, would have been unnecessary but for their unbelief. And the book of Numbers is going to focus, is on, focus on that. You say, gee, what's that got to do with us? Because we have the same challenges. As we go through the book of Numbers, we should understand that we ha are faced with the same issues in many respects. We may not be, they may not be packaged in exactly the same way, but we need to understand that. The 38 years from the giving of the law at Sinai to the eve that Joshua takes over and launches the seven-year conquest of Canaan. We say 40 years in the wilderness, that's a round-off. In the scripture, you'll discover precisely it's 38 years. And that, to me, is extremely provocative because Jesus, in Luke 21, tells the believers there that when they see Jerusalem surrounded by armies to get out of town, head for the hills and don't let anyone come back into town. And he said, this generation will not pass away till all this be fulfilled. And within 38 years, the Roman, Romans uh, led a siege that brought down Jerusalem, the famous fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Now we know from the writings of Eusebius that the Christians, on, uh, honoring what Christ told them, as recorded in Luke 21, fled to Pella in P P uh, Perea, which is east of the Jordan. And according to Eusebius, not one Christian perished, even though over a million and a half men, women, and children perished in Jerusalem. The Christians got out because Christ warned them to. Don't confuse Luke's rendering with Matthew's, which is a similar but different presentation. Luke did it during the day in the temple. Matthew's is a private briefing, confidential briefing, which is Matthew 24. Many people think they're the same. They're distinctively different. Let's move on. This chronicle in the book of Numbers We'll talk about the successes and failures of this 38 years, the so-called wilderness wanderings, and they have many lessons for us. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 10, all these things happen unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are coming. In other words, each one of these stories that we're going to encounter in the book of Numbers applies to us, too, in some way. The word examples there in, in the Greek text is tupos, from which we get the term type. We use the term prototype in engineering, a type or a model. The more common vernacular in our language is a model. These things are models or, or foreshadowings, in effect. And uh, the literary term is types, and you'll hear us talk a lot about types. Well, just a, a quick snapshot of review. Um, we talked about in, in the chapter 2, we had all these numberings. What on earth can come from these numberings? And it's just an example that if you take the details that are there by the Holy Spirit and presume that they're there deliberately by design, that will lead you to discovery, and that discoveries are sometimes quite surprising. They were told to, uh, be, to, to camp in, in uh, four camps of three tribes each in, on the four points of the compass. And if you do that with the, with the numbers that are there and build a scale model of what's described in Numbers 2, you get a model of the camp of Israel from the air, and of course it's a cross. The longest one being the camp of Judah, the shortest being the camp of Ephraim, the other two nominally the same length. Very interesting model, surprise perhaps to many. You won't find it in most commentaries. We also talked about the tabernacle, and I won't go through that here, but just by way of review, we did talk about how every particular item of that tabernacle speaks, of course, of Jesus Christ. And these uh, seven elements, are, of course, are uh, of the, the tabernacle proper, were the custodianship. We talked about the coverings also. And again, I won't recover all that here. But I do want to point out that of the, tri of the Levites, we have three families. The Gershonites, which took the cloths, linens, and the fence, and that stuff. 
Uh, we had the Kohathites, which took the holy object, the seven appliances that are in, in the building. And the Merarites took the actual framework. These were the way they divi divided up the tasks when they moved. They had a portable sanctuary, and these are the guys that set it up, took it down, and so forth. Moses and the priests uh, ensconced on the east side, the rest of the Levites on the three sides. And we'll talk more about those as we get into tonight's lesson. And uh, we talked about the preparation of the camp in chapter 5. We talked about the Nazarite vow and the, 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 uh, a glimpse of the Trinity in chapter 6. And these are the lessons of the previous time. All preparing us for the walk, the work, the warfare, as well as the worship in the book of Numbers. We did encounter, and I, I, as I tried to, as I picked highlights of the previous sessions, I couldn't leave this one alone, even though it's just a short verse, the end of chapter 6. But if you remember nothing else of the early part of Numbers, I do hope you remember what's called the Old Testament benediction. You'll see many churches use it to close their services. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. And what's interesting about this thing is that many pastors don't recognize that we have the Trinity implied here. And uh, the, whole, the Trinity is all through the Old Testament. Um, in the, uh, the Jewish people emphasize that the Shema says, Hero is the Lord our God is one Lord. The word is echad in the Hebrew, which, uh, is, it, which, can mean, which means unity. It doesn't, well, you and I have a tough time visualizing plurality contained within that unity. But that's exactly what the term is intended to convey. Uh, just like Adam and Eve are said to be one flesh, the same word, echad. And uh, they're distinct, Adam and Eve, but they are one flesh before the Lord. And uh, so that we have plurality here. Elohim, every place the word Elohim occurs in the scripture, there's a grammatical error because it's a plural noun treated as a singular by the verbs. We have, of course, uh, in, the, in the Old Testament, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit uh, uh, in, in the language itself. Another example of this was to take a look. Well, you even see this plurality, by the way, show up in the English translation. In Genesis 1, let us make man in our own image. Who is he talking to? In Genesis chapter 3, behold, man has become one of what? Us, plural. See, the Trinity is hinted at all through here. Let, let us go down and so forth. Um, whom should, well, God says, who shall I say? Who will go for us? God is asking. So the other thing that really is the most convincing argument for me was to take, make a list of the major events in the Bible and find out who they're ascribed to. The creation of the universe is ascribed to the Father in Psalm 102. In Colossians 1 and John 1, it's clearly the Son. And in Genesis 1 and Job 26, it's the Holy Spirit. Same thing with the creation of man. Genesis 2, 7, it's the Father. Colossians 1, 16, it's the Son. And Job 33, it's the Spirit. Each one of the major events in the Bible are ascribed to each of the three persons. The incarnation is to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in Hebrews, Philippians, and Luke. The death of Christ is ascribed to the Father in Psalm 22, in Romans 8, in John 3, 16, the most famous verse in the Bible. It's ascribed to the Son, John 10, Galatians 2. I lay it down myself, he says, and so forth, in, in the Spirit in Hebrews 9. The atonement, same thing. Isaiah, Ephesians, Hebrews all ascribe the atonement to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit individually. The resurrection. And we could go on and on. There's actually 30 or 40 of these. But I just picked a, I picked a, I figured seven's a nice round number, but eight gives us a new beginning, right? So the inspiration of the scriptures too. Okay. We're now in this group of chapters we're going to take on tonight. We'll call it the journey to Kadesh Barnea. Kadesh Barnea. And as we do this, you need to understand that Kadesh Barnea was a watershed event in the history of Israel. Their entire history would have been different had it, been not, had, not, had it not been for their disbelief in this critical confrontation. And the reason we want to pay attention to it is because each one of us has a Kadesh Barnea. Emerson has often quoted the saddest words of tongue or pen are these. So we're going to Take chapters 10 through 14. Don't panic. Several of these aren't that long. <laughs> the first, chapter 10, they'll depart from Sinai. Then there's a couple of rebellions and murmurings, 11 and 12. But the critical part of this will be chapters 13 and 14. The departure from Sinai. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Make thee two trumpets of silver, 
Of a whole piece shalt thou make them, that thou mayest use them for the calling of the assembly and for the adjourning of the uh, camp. Josephus describes this, and the Arch of Titus has models of this. They were about a cubit or more in length. They were the thickness of a like of a flute, made of solid silver, therefore they had a very shrill sound, and uh, the purity of the metal being a part of it, and the silver, of course, being the metal of redemption. So that all has implications here. And when they shall blow with them, all the assembly shall assemble themselves to thee at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Now you have to understand, there's a couple of million people. <laughs> so when they're assembling, there's, there's some order to their assembly. And if they blow but with one trumpet, then the princes which are the heads of the thousands of Israel shall gather themselves unto thee. When ye blow an alarm, then the camps that lie on the east part shall go forward. Each one of the camps... Remember, the camps are groups of three tribes. We covered that before. So there's four camps, okay? And uh, they, they march, they, there's a marching order that's going to be laid out here. When you blow an alarm the second time, then the camps that lie on the south side shall take their journey. They shall blow an alarm for their journeys. And when the congregation is to be gathered together, ye shall blow, but ye shall not sound an alarm. There's different styles of, of blowing, and the... Hebrew texts and the Septuagint and other rabbinical writings don't quite agree as to what constituted an alarm and a call, you know, whether a series of short blasts or long. There's, there are traditions today, but you should know if you peel that onion, you discover there's rabbinical arguments back in the weeds as to exactly which uh, was which. So we won't try to sort that out here. And the sons of Aaron, the priests, shall blow with the trumpets, and they shall be to you for an ordinance throughout your generations. And if you go to war in your land against the enemy that presseth you, then ye shall blow an alarm with the trumpets, and ye shall be remembered before the Lord your God, and ye shall be saved from your enemies. Do you believe it? They didn't. Sounds good. Sounds great Sunday morning to nod in agreement to the minister when he's preaching. During the week, it may have a very hollow sound. And that's exactly what we're going to find here. And in the day of your gladness, and in your solemn days, and in the beginnings of your months, ye you shall blow with the trumpets over your burnt offerings, and over the sacrifice of your peace offerings, and they, that they may be to you for a memorial before your God. I am the Lord, your God. Okay, so that trip now begins. Numbers 10, starting in verse 11, it came to pass on the 20th day of the second month, in the second year that the cloud was taken up from off the tabernacle of testimony. What did that mean? It's time to move, guys, right? They've been there one year, okay? And it's only 20 days after the beginning of their instruction, if you may recall. The children of Israel took their journeys out of the wilderness of Sinai, and the cloud rested in the wilderness of Paran. And they first took their journey according to the commandment of the Lord by the hand of Moses. Now, one of the things that I have not done in this series is try to show you the maps I usually show you, because most of the maps I discover in most of the commentaries have a certain degree of uncertainty because they all presume that they're coming up the Sinai Peninsula. That doesn't make sense if you really know the geography. And one of the things that, uh, for which there's a lot of evidence accumulating to confirm is that the real Mount Sinai is not in the Sinai Peninsula, the traditional location. It's uh, Jabal al Laws in Arabia. And there's all kinds of discoveries that support that, which means the place, the wilderness they're wandering in, is in Midian, the very place that God had Moses spend 40 years before all of this. And so as they wander through that area, the geography gives you a different perspective. The only thing we really need here is to understand that Kadesh Barnea is in the southern part of what we think of as Israel. It's even south of Beersheba, which is way down in the desert. So it's a very southerly location, apparently. But there are some scholastic debates, not critical to our purpose. That's one reason I didn't bother barraging you with maps that have doubts about them in the first place. But we'll do that later when we can. And they first took the journey according to the commandment of the Lord by the hand of Moses. And in the first place went the standard of the camp of the children of who? Judah. The camp of Judah, the tribe of Judah, and the other two. According to their armies. And over his host was Nashon, the son of Abinadab. And over the host of the tribe of the children of Issachar was Nethaniel, the son of Zoar. And over the host of the tribe of the children of Zebulun was Eliab, the son of Helon. In other words, these, uh, the uh, Issachar and Zebulun being part of the camp of Judah. Okay? 
Four camp, 12 tribes, four camps. The tabernacle then was taken down. By the time they're on their way, the tabernacle was taken down, and the sons of Gershon and the sons of Merari set forward bearing the tabernacle. So you remember of the three uh, families, the, uh, the Gershonites and the Merarites are next in the marching order. They follow the camp of Judah. Okay? Kohathites, not yet. The standard of the camp of Reuben set forward according to their armies. In other words, we now have the, 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 the trumpets sound twice. From the south, we have the camp of Judah, uh, Reuben, excuse me. We have the standard of the camp of Reuben set forward according to their armies, and over their, his host was Eli, Elizur, the son of Shedir, and over the host of the tribe of the children of Simeon was uh, Shelemiel, which is the son of Zurish Hadai, and over the host of the tribe of the children of Gad was Eliasaph, the son of Duel. So again, we have a camp of three tribes, the, the camp of Reuben. After that camp, the trumpet sounds, and we have the Kohathites set forward, bearing the sanctuary. And the other did set up the tabernacle against they came. So it gives th those guys time, and then they're preceded then by camp, the two families, and then uh, Reuben, and then the Kohathites. And we'll take a summary of this before we're through here. Then the Kohathites, what they're carrying are the holy objects. The Ark of the Covenant and all the seven wrapped implements, they have been wrapped by Aaron and the priests, but they're then carried by the Kohathites. There is a point of confusion. Most commentaries presume that the Ark of the Covenant is up front. There's some scripture to indicate the Ark, the Ark of the Covenant was wrapped not visible, and carried by the Kohathites. So I'm not going to get into that debate, but you should understand that the presumption that the ark leads the whole thing, there's some, there's some, there's some passages that allude to its significance that doesn't mean necessarily it was in front, but that's where many scholars presume it was, but it's, it's, it's a point of dispute. But we'll move on. The standard of the camp of the children of Ephraim set forward according to their armies, and over his host was Elishama, the son of Mahud, and over the host of the camp of the children of Manasseh was Gamaliel, the son of Pedazur, and uh, over the host of the tribe of the children of Benjamin was Abaddon, the son of Gideoni. And so then we have the final camp left, to the camp of Dan. The standard of the camp of the children of Dan set forward, which was the rearward of all the camps throughout their hosts, and over his host was Ahizer, the son of Amishadai. Now, this uh, Ahizer, by the way, was the guy that didn't like the idea that their tribal ensign was a serpent from, Gen from Genesis 49. So he changed it to a serpent in the mouth of an eagle. That's a little more palatable. And over time, the eagle then becomes the symbol of the tribe of Dan. Okay. You may wonder about that because it's, it's, it's an inference. But, um, and over the host of the tribe of the children of Asher was Pegiel, the son of Akron, and over the host of the tribe of the children of Naphtali was Ahira, the son of Anan. Obviously, uh, Asher and Naphtali being the other two tribes that make up the camp of Dan, and so now we have the whole bunch. So we have Moses and Aaron in front from chapter 10, verse 33, we'll encounter. The camp of Judah, then Gershon and the Merari families of the Levites, then the camp of Reuben, then the Kohathites finishing the Levites, then the camp of Ephraim, and the camp of Dan. Now out of all this comes an insight that you won't find in most commentaries. How many trumpets were blown? Anyone guess? Seven. Seven trumpets. And you can put that as a footnote when you study Revelation chapter 8 with the seven trumpets calling an assembly and so forth. All right? Just thought I'd share that with you. Yeah, each one of these is a trumpet blowing. And they did that to organize the march. The first, you know, anyway, if you go through it, there's seven trumpets. That's kind of fun. Okay. Thus were the journeys of the children of Israel according to their armies when they set forward. And Moses said to Hobab, the son of Reguel, the Midianite, Moses' father-in-law, we are journeying unto the place of which the Lord said, I will give it to you. Come thou with us, and we will do thee good. For the Lord hath spoken good concerning Israel. Now, a big debate here. Some people feel those are alternative names for, for uh, Jethro. 
But there are others that believe that this is his second wife, and we're going to have that view confirmed, I think, shortly, because that's what Miriam and his sister is all upset about, that he's got a, a second wife. Is this not, we're not talking about Zipporah here. We're talking about another wife, so for what it's worth. But in any case, he encourages his father-in-law to uh, come with him because he knows the turf. By the way, they don't need him to know the turf. Who is their leader? God is. So let's be sensitive to that, that there's an issue lurking behind this. He said him, and he said unto him, I will not go, but I will depart to mine own land and to my kindred. And he said, Leave us not, I pray thee, for as much as thou knowest how we are to encamp in the wilderness, and thou mayest be to us instead of eyes. And it shall be, if thou go with us, yea, it shall be that what goodness the Lord shall do unto us, the same will he do unto thee. I suppose if we were smart, he could say, thanks, but, but for the glory and honor, I'd rather pass, because it's going to be a tough time. But it, anyway, it, it leaves a little unclear what, what he finally decided to do. In any case, verse 33, they parted from the Mount of the Lord three days' journey, and the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord went before them in the three days' journey to search out a resting place for them. And it's on this basis that most scholars presume that the Ark is in the lead, in the lead of, the, um, uh, uh, of the camp. And this is in contradistinction to the fact that it's wrapped and only to be seen by the priests. So there's a, a rabbinical dispute behind all that. We'll move on. And the cloud of the Lord was upon them by day when they went out of the camp. And it came to pass when the ark set forward that the, Moses said, Raise, Rise up, Lord, and let thine enemies be scattered, and let them that hate thee flee before thee. And when it rested, he said, Return, O Lord, unto the many thousands of Israel. And this, of course, is the basic dynamic that is intended all through the wilderness wanderings. But now we're getting to chapter 11, which I'm going to call Quailing the Rebellion, and there's a deliberate pun involved here, okay? When the people complained, it displeased the Lord. You know, we've had some friends of ours, I remember many years ago when, when the Ten Commandments first came out as a movie, we had some uh, of our relatives that were stunned by the movie, uh, they couldn't understand how the, the people, after seeing all those miracles, could still disbelieve God. That was their primary. And, you know, it's interesting that even from just the secular observer, they're stunned with the fact that here, these people who were delivered by such drama from Egypt. In fact, so dramatically that God, throughout the rest of history, points back to that as evidence of how powerful he is. It wasn't just a few little parlor tricks. It was a, it was a heavy-handed deal. And yet, despite that, they, people continually rebel, complain, murmur, unhappy. And we're going to see that as a pattern. And we've got to be careful. Because there, but for the grace of God, go you and I. When the people complained, it displeased the Lord. And the Lord heard it. And his anger was kindled. And the fire of the Lord burnt among them and consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. He didn't mess around. And the people cried unto Moses, and when Moses prayed unto the Lord, the fire was quenched. That's also a pattern all the way through. When Moses goes up before the Lord, things change. And he called the name of the place Tabera, which because of the fire of the Lord, a burnt among them. The word Tabera means Burning. And it did not become a normal place name, by the way, because it doesn't get, it's, it's, it's omitted from later lists of their itinerary. But at least it was uh, 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 the label of the, of the moment. And the mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting. Now, notice that phrase. You see, we have up in front the four camps, camp of Judah, Reuben, Ephraim, and Dan, and of course the Levites and their, and their families. But behind that whole march were the mixed multitude, people who may have had uh, a mother that was uh, Jewish and a father that was pagan, all kinds of people of a mixed background. They weren't really part of the covenant people, the mixed multitude. And that's always where the trouble starts. That's always where the trouble starts. And I know many of you who have families and you have a son or daughter that started to get serious with uh, another with a, a would-be spouse that isn't saved. And it's always a source of anguish. It's always a source of anguish, and for good reason. It's called being unequally yoked. It's a very serious issue. Anyway, 
The mixed multitude that was among them felt a lusting, and the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? See, complaining is contagious. I remember when I was in the regiment. One of the things you learn in a regiment is when there's you know, be, be getting together and there's some news comes out that is just a disaster, liberty's canceled, or, or some big thing you were looking forward to has been diverted, whatever. Um, the naive regiments will groan and mumble and whatever. The real professionals don't because they know that's contagious. It makes it worse. It's an interesting lesson you learn um, that uh, there's nothing as contagious as complaining. And that just amplifies the negative. The smart guys, you know, new day, new deal kind of thing. Who shall give us flesh to eat? Verse 5, we remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely. And indeed they did. Was a, that was a very, very staple uh, food item in Egypt. We did eat in Egypt freely. And the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic... And the commentaries are full of examples how these particular items were unusually fruitful in the unusual soil of the Nile. The cucumbers are, are, are very distinctive. Uh, the melons, the leeks, the onions, the garlic are all, all uh, very distinctive in that region. But so they're complaining. We remember all that. But now our soul is dried away. There is nothing at all besides this manna before our eyes. Now, the manna was, it says, like a coriander seed, and the color thereof is the color of bedillium, which is just uh, sort of yellowish. And the people went about and gathered it and ground it in mills and beat it in a mortar and baked it in pans and made cakes of it, and the taste of it was as the taste of fresh oil. And when the dew fell upon the camp in the night, the manna fell upon it. So this is manna. Most of you know manna, what it means is, what is it? When it, when it first came, what is it? That, what is this stuff? That's what, it, that's what it means. And it was in thin flakes. From the script, like a coriander seed, which is, was an herb. It looked like rosin, tasted like honey wafers, and like something made with olive oil. They, they were instructed to take an omer, that's about two quarts worth, in a jar, to put it either in or near the Ark of the Covenant and the Holy of Holies. Most people presume it was in. There's some dispute that it was next to it. It disappears later on. Um, but initially that's what they did do as a memorial for the nation and um, the manna. And uh, obviously the problem is is that they're making cakes with it, they're making muffins with it, they're baking bread with it, they're making manna pancakes, <laughs> they're making, uh, you know, manicotti, <laughs> manna shepherds, or whatever, okay. So it was supplied to them, by the way, until they began to eat the produce of the land. In the days of Joshua, when they enter the land, the manna stops. So during the entire 38 years of wandering the wilderness, this was God's provision. And it's very instructive to understand that this is introduced in Exodus chapter 16. There's manna, and they're instructed to gather it for six days. Only as much as they can use. It will not keep. It'll spoil. So you only, you, you, every, every person had to get their own and collect for, you know, for, their, for their needs, but not more than that. Until Friday. On Friday, there'd be twice as much, and they were allowed to take enough for Shabbat. Because none would fall on Shabbat. And for some strange reason, that didn't spoil overnight. Get the picture? Now, what's fascinating about uh, Exodus 16 is it's four chapters before Exodus 20. Exodus 20 is when the law is given. Understand what's going on here. They are observing Shabbat before the law was given. When the law is given... They're instructed to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, but it didn't institute then. Because of their, their, their diligence in that regard, it becomes an emblem of the nation Israel. But it wasn't ordained as a result of the law. It was being practiced before the law was given. Where was it in, in, introduced? Genesis chapter 2. That's one reason we take Shabbat seriously. 
We're not under the law. We don't tally 613 commandments, whatever. But that doesn't mean we don't respect and honor the appointment God has ordained. But the, so that's the, man, that's the quick snapshot of the manna. Mo, Moses heard the people weep throughout their families, every man in the door of his tent, and the anger of the Lord was kindled greatly. And Moses also was displeased. Moses said unto the Lord, Wherefore hast thou afflicted thy servant, and wherefore have I not found favor in thy sight, that thou layest the burden of all this people upon me? <laughs> Moses is saying, I didn't ask for this job, okay? You gave me these people, these stiff-necked, honorary people. And every time I read something about Jewish politics, I'm just glad I'm not trying to be prime minister of that, that crowd of people. You know, we have two Jews, you have three political parties, you know. Moses, have I conceived these? <laughs> this is, this is my, I want you to notice how he's talking here. And I, I always feel hindered that I don't have a good New York accent to deliver this, you know. But uh, I want you to contrast later when he goes to bat for these people. It'll astonish you. But right now, he is really upset. Moses, have I conceived these, all these people? Have I conceived all these people? Have I begotten them that thou shouldest say unto me, Carry them in thy bosom as a, as a nursing father bear the sucking child unto the land which thou swearest unto their fathers? Whence should I have flesh to give all these people? For they weep unto me, saying, Give us flesh that we may eat. In other words, how can he possibly here in the wilderness comply with this requirement? Well, first of all, no one asked him to. This is God's responsibility. Someone defined worry as assuming a responsibility God didn't intend you to have. I like that. Moses continues, I am not able to bear all these people alone because it's too heavy for me. And if thou deal thus with me, kill me. I pray thee out of hand. If I have found favor in thy sight, let me not see my wretchedness. So Moses is, is subject to depression here, I guess. Huh? The Lord said unto Moses, Gather unto me seventy men of the elders of Israel, whom thou knowest to be leaders of the people and officers over them. And bring them unto the tabernacle of the congregation, that they may stand there with thee. And I will come down and talk with thee there, and I will take of the Spirit which is upon thee, and will put it upon them. And they shall bear the burden of the people with thee, that thou bear it not thyself alone. So God is yielding to the fact that this is a big job. There are traditions that this was the origin of the Sanhedrin. That may be true, it might not. It's a colorful tradition. Clearly, the Sanhedrin does emerge later, the Council of Seventy. And, uh, but uh, whether it really starts here or not is, is, is a, another one of these rabbinical debates. Verse 18, and, thou, and say thou unto the people, Sanctify yourselves against tomorrow. In other words, separate yourself, so to speak. Against tomorrow. And ye shall eat flesh. For ye have wept in the ears of the Lord, saying, Who shall give us flesh to eat? For it was well with us in Egypt. Therefore the Lord will give you flesh, and ye shall eat. <laughs> but watch out. <laughs> ye shall not eat one day, nor two days, nor five days, neither ten days, nor twenty days, but even a whole month, until it come out at your nostrils, and it be loathsome unto you, because that ye have despised the Lord which is among you, and have wept before him, saying, Why came we forth out of Egypt? And Moses said, The people among whom I am are 600,000 footmen, and thou hast said, I will give them flesh that they may eat of the whole month. Shall the flocks and herds be slain for them and so, uh, to suffice them? And shall all the fish of the sea be gathered together for them to suffice them? Moses wondering, Where is it coming from? Lord said unto Moses, Is the Lord's hand wax short? Thou shalt see now whether my word shall come to pass unto thee or not. So this is a, this is a call to faith for Moses too, okay? Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord, and gathered the seventy men of the elders of the people, and set them round about the tabernacle. I want to remind you what God tells us in the New Testament, Philippians 4, 6, Be careful or anxious. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus, or in Christ Jesus. Be anxious for nothing. That's a command. Well, the Lord came down in the cloud, verse 25, 
and spake unto them, and took of the spirit that was upon him, and gave it unto the seventy elders. And it came to pass that when, they, when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied and did not cease. So they entered into a, a mode of, of communication that was clear. The Holy Spirit had descended upon them. But there remained two of the men in the camp. The name of one was Eldad, and the name of the other was Medad. And the spirit rested upon them. And they were of them that were written, but went not out unto the tabernacle. And they prophesied in the camp. And there ran a young man and told Moses, and said, Eldad and Medad do prophesy in the camp. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of Moses, one of his young men, answered and said, My Lord Moses, forbid them. And Moses said unto him, Envious thou for my sake? Would God that all the Lord's people were prophets, and the Lord would put his spirit upon them. And Moses got him into the camp, he and the elders of Israel. It's a very revealing attitude, the part of Moses. He was glad when he saw uh, people uh, anointed by the Lord. You know, it's interesting. There are some pastors that I know very, very well here in this region who rejoice when someone leaves their church to join another church because it makes room for a new, new member. They're, all they care about is people getting saved, not just their turf. That's refreshing. That's refreshing. It's unfortunately not the typical case, but it is refreshing when you find it. Verse 31, And there went forth a wind from the Lord, and brought quails from the sea, and let them fall by the camp, as it were a day's journey on this side, and as it were a day's journey on the other side, round about the camp. And as it were two cubits high upon the face of the earth. That's three feet, roughly. Now, there's different views of what this three feet, were they three feet thick, 20 miles around? I don't think so. What it may simply mean, there were piles that deep, and or, they were flying so low they could swat them down. And there are good scholars that try to analyze this because it's referred to several places in the Bible. Not, 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 it gets quite resolved. But you don't, there are alternative understandings without doing violence to the text. You're not talking about three feet and 400 square miles. You know, it, it, you, you can get carried away. That's a, <laughs> that's a lot of quail. But they, clearly they did have more quail than they wanted. And the people stood up all that day and all that night and, and all the next day. And they gathered the quails. And he that gathered least gathered 10 homers. That's about 86 gallons. That was the smallest gathering. Yeah, wow, that's exactly right. And they spread them all abroad for themselves round about the camp. And while the flesh was yet between their teeth, ere it was chewed, the wrath of the Lord was kindled against the people, and the Lord smote the people with a very great plague. And he called the name of that place Kibroth, Hatava, which means the graves of craving, because they were buried. There, there they buried the people that lusted. And all the people journeyed from Kibroth, Hatava, to Hazaroth, and abode at Hazaroth. So, yeah, the, the first label just means the graves of craving. Well, we're not through with murmuring. We get to chapter 12. Miriam, that's, you know, Moses' sister, and Aaron. Aaron's involved here. Miriam is mentioned first. She's the instigator of this. And Aaron spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married. For he had married an Ethiopian woman. That's why most scholars feel that this was a second marriage. Not Zipporah, but that's of Midian. That's a whole other issue. And they said, Hath the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Hath he not spoken also by us? And the Lord heard it. Now we have an insert here that may not have been Moses' own penmanship. It might have been added by um, Ezra, who's compiling this later. It says, Now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. And uh, there are scholars that suspect that was an, a scribal addition when this was codified by Ezra, which is what really became the, 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 uh, the Tanakh later. And the Lord spake suddenly or, unto Moses and unto Aaron and unto Miriam, Come out, ye three, unto the tabernacle of the congregation. And the three came out. And the Lord came down in the pillar of the cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam, and they both came forth. 
And incidentally, this is the Lord's voice they're hearing. God's actual voice is recorded in Exodus 19, Exodus 24, and Exodus 34. This is, uh, may, may be surprising. They're all being addressed here. And he said, hear now my words. Can you imagine God talking that way to this little committee meeting? <laughs> if there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make himself known unto him in a vision and will speak unto him in a dream. My servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in all mine house. With him will I speak mouth to mouth, even apparently not in the dark speeches and the similitude of the Lord shall he behold. Wherefore, then were ye not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? God is saying, you guys have a lot of chutzpah. <laughs> and the anger of the Lord was kindled against him. You know, whenever I read that, I, I, I cringe. The anger of the Lord, you know, man. The anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. And the cloud departed from off the tabernacle. Wow. And behold, Miriam became leprous, white as snow. And Aaron looked upon Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. Aaron gets off on this thing because if he got leprous, it would interrupt the services. He couldn't minister. So by virtue of his office, the, the primary focus here is on Miriam, and she apparently was the instigator in the first place anyway. And Aaron said unto Moses, Alas, my Lord, I beseech thee, lay not the sin upon us wherein we have done foolishly and wherein we have sinned. Let her not be as one dead of whom the flesh is half consumed when he cometh out of his mother's womb. And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, Heal her now, O God, I beseech thee. So Aaron goes to bat for her, and of course Moses does. The Lord said unto Moses, If her father had but spit in her face, should she not be ashamed seven days? Let her be shut out from the camp seven days, and after that let her be received again. And Miriam was shut out from the camp seven days, and the people journeyed not till Miriam was brought in again, and afterward the people removed from Hazaroth and pitched in the wilderness of Paran. So, you know, Aaron does slip through this one, but Aaron has always been sort of a reed in the wind. Remember the golden calf episode at Sinai and so forth. And so Aaron, Aaron uh, is, is, is um, a reed in the wind to some extent. So that's, this is just another case. Okay. I've got a little quiz that I'm sure you'll pass. I'm going to list some people on the, here. Here's a group of guys. You recognize them, of course. If I tell you that each one is from one of the tribes, you begin to clue who they are. Ten of these guys are losers. And two are winners. They're the two winners. And they changed their life because they did a very simple thing. They just stood up for the Lord. And the other ten probably meant well. They certainly were very sincere. But they caused their entire nation to wander for 38 years. Numbers 13, verse 16, these are the names of the men which Moses sent out to spy out the land. And Moses called Oshea, the son of Nun, Yehoshua. And uh, Oshea, or Hoshua, Hoshea, is the name Joshua. And we're going to hear more of these two guys, Caleb and Joshua. And, and, and by the way, Yehoshua is the Hebrew for what you would put in the Greek, you'd call it Jesus. Did you know that there's a book in the Old Testament? that's named Jesus, in effect, book of Joshua. And you'll, if you study the book of Joshua, you'll discover it's a model, an outline of the book of Revelation, where another Yehoshua disp dispossesses the land, the whole planet Earth, of the usurpers, and sends in two witnesses to begin with. He doesn't need the other ten, and so forth. Seven trumpets, and on it goes. It's astonishing to make a list of the, of the parallels between the book of Joshua and the book of Revelation. But let's we'll keep moving here. So we now have the preparation for an intelligence mission. Chapter 13. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Send thou men that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel, and of every tribe of their fathers shall ye send a man, every one a ruler among them. This verse is very misleading. 
you get the impression that this idea was the Lord's. It turns out you'll discover it wasn't. He's just giving in to their request. He didn't require 12 to go in there. He knew what he was doing. He didn't need their intelligence report. They asked, and you'll, I'll show you why in a minute. Verse 3, Moses, by the command of the Lord, sent them from the wilderness of Paran. All these men were heads of the children of Israel. These were their names. Of the tri and, and we go through the same list that I just gave you. I don't have to read them again. You get the picture. These are the 12 tribes, the leader of the 12 tribes. And this is the list that we looked at just a minute ago. The two that we want to keep an eye on are Caleb and Hosea, who is renamed Joshua. Simply putting the name of God in front of his name. Yehoshua. These are the names of the men which Moses sent out to spy the land, and Moses called Hosea, the son of Nun, Yehoshua. And Moses sent them out to spy out the land of Canaan, and said unto them, Get you up this way southward, and go up into the mountain, and see the land, what it is, and the people that dwell therein, whether they be strong, or weak, or few, or many. So they're sent out to explore both regions, the south, the Negev, and the north, all the way up to the uh, Galan, even uh, literally where we today would call Lebanon. And uh, so, understand the sequence. You'll discover it in a few minutes. I'll show you why. The, the people wanted this, so God agreed, and God tells Moses to go ahead and do it. So Moses is doing what God told him to do, but God is responding to the people's request. That'll turn out to be important. And what the land is that they dwell in, whether it be good or bad, and what the cities they be that dwell in, whether in tents or in strongholds, and what the land is, whether it be fat or lean, whether it be wood therein or not. And be ye of good courage, and bring of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the time of the first ripe, ripe grapes. These guys are going to travel about 250 miles. They'll spend 40 days doing this. Um, they're going to go um, to Hebron. We'll talk a little bit about Hebron. That's where the patriarchs are buried. It's a very important city for lots of reasons. Um, so they went up and searched the land from the wilderness of Zin to Rehob as men came to Hamath, and they ascended by the south, came to Hebron, and uh, where Ahaman, uh, Shishai, and Talmai, the children of Anak, were. Now Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. A couple of things. We're going to talk about the Anakim. The sons of Anak are more than meets the eye. Um, in verse 33 of this chapter, the text will use the term Nephilim. There were Nephilim in the land. That's going to be a very important part. Most people who read this will not understand it unless they've done their homework in Genesis chapter 6. But um, it's interesting that the text includes this strange remark about Hebron. Because Zon is one of the ancient, ancient places in uh, Egypt that the Hyksos made their capital when they overran Egypt. And this seems to imply that Israel had first-hand experience with that. So that, it's, a, it's a fascinating area to do some research in. But Hebron itself, the city, should be a reminder of God's promises. This is where the patriarchs were buried in Genesis 23 and so on. And the text says built seven years before Zoan. The other names for Zoan are Tanis and Avaris, which are le legendary cities in Egypt for lots of reasons. It was the Hyksos capital. Built about 1700 B.C. That's a long time ago. But here Hebron is at the heart of Israel's goal. But right at the heart of Israel's goal are the Anakim. Back in Genesis 15 and Genesis 17, God told Abraham that his descendants would be gone for four centuries. But after four centuries, they'd come back to inherit the land. When God reveals that to Abraham, Satan was listening. Satan knew he had four centuries to lay down a minefield. And that's, that's where he lays down the Nephilim, these strange hybrids that were uh, apparently very similar to the reason the flood came in Genesis 6. In Genesis chapter 6, it mentions that there were Nephilim in the land. It says that uh, uh, when this, this, the uh, sons of God came down to the daughters of men and took them wives and gave birth to the Hagibarim. The, the, uh, there were, the Nephilim were the fallen ones. The Nephilim comes from the Hebrew word to, to fall. 
In the Greek, it's gigantes, which means the earthborn. Um, they happen to be giants, and that's the way it's translated in your English, but it misses the key uh, implication here. These were hybrids. That's why God sent the flood to wipe them out. But in verse 4 of Genesis 6, also after that, and all through the Old Testament, you'll run into the Anakim. You'll, we're going to encounter them very heavily. God tells Joshua to wipe out every man, woman, and child of certain tribes. Well, as a New Testament reader, we can't relate to that until, unless we understand that there's a gene pool problem that God is dealing with there, just as he did in Genesis 6. And the Anakim are the sons of Anak, and the derivative of that was Go uh, Goliath, as an example. These, by the way, are mentioned in the Egyptian texts of that century back then. Caleb, who inherits the area of Hebron, does eventually defeat the Anakim there. He, he acquits himself very honorably. And, of course, Hebron becomes David's capital when he's the king of Judah, not the king of the nation. That, that becomes Jerusalem. But while he's, the king, while he's head over Judah, that's who he sets his capital in Hebron. And they came to the brook Eshgal and cut down from thence a branch with one cluster of grapes. Get this, it's one cluster of grapes. And they bear it between two on a staff. And they brought of the pomegranates and of the figs. And the place is called the brook of Eshgal because of the cluster of grapes which the children of Israel cut down from thence. And you will see little figurines all through Israel as little gifts of two guys with a post between them and this huge bunch of grapes hanging. In fact, the so-called grapes of Eshgal are the official insignia of the Ministry of Tourism. I forgot I meant to do a slide of that so you could see it, but it's actually used as, as their emblem for the Ministry of Tourism, very understandably. And they returned from searching of the land after 40 days, and they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel and uh, unto the wilderness of Paran and to Kadesh. And they brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him and said, We came unto the land where thou sendest us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Good so far, right? Then we get to that horrible word of disbelief called nevertheless. Nevertheless. You know the feeling. You've been called into the boss's office, and he says, boy, you've done a really good job, and this, you did that right, you did that right. And then he gets to the word nevertheless. It sounds like a pink slip's coming, doesn't it? <laughs> nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. And, uh, you know, the very words of these spies give them away. The land to which you sent us. Really. See, there's no mention that the Lord sent them. There's no mention that God had given them a promise. There's no acknowledgement of God having sent them or God's commitment to protect them. You see, these are speaking in the framework of unbelief. And the Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. That's, that's, the, that's the majority report, 10 of the 12. That's, what that's the theme of what they're singing. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and possess it. For we are well able to overcome it. That's Caleb's attitude. But the men went up with him and said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. And here's a key verse, verse 33. And there we saw the Nephilim, translated giants in the English, but it misses the tone of that word. The Nephilim, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants, or the Nephilim. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, so we were in their sight. Now you and I would read that and say, boy, they must be exaggerating until we find out later in the Old Testament about the king of Og. 
whose bed was 13 feet long. Okay? And you start reading about Goliath, you begin to realize these creatures were giants. The fact that we're giants isn't the problem. They were giants. These guys, you know, they may, be, they may be using a figure of speech here, but clearly they were terrified. You and I would be too. If we didn't have the confidence of God behind us. And both Joshua and Caleb had that confidence. And they'll be rewarded for it. The word giants, Nephilim, translated giants, but it really comes from Nephal, the fallen ones. In the Greek, it's called gigantes, which is not giants there. It's called the uh, it's the sons of Gaia, or earthborn, is what it means. Let's stop from Numbers for a minute, and let's read a parallel passage from Deuteronomy, because it'll give you a whole other insight here. This is Moses, the book of Deuteronomy are three sermons that Moses gives at the end of his life as he wraps up his ministry. In Deuteronomy 1, starting at verse 21, Behold, the Lord thy God hath set the land before thee, Go up and possess it as the Lord God of thy fathers had said unto thee. Fear not, neither be discouraged. And ye came near unto me, every one of you, and said, We will send men before us, and they shall search out the land and bring us word again by what way we must go up and into what cities we shall come. See, I thought the Lord was going to lead them. No, the people wanted to check it out so they know where they're going. This is Deuteronomy. Notice I'm not in numbers here, I'm in Deuteronomy. And the saying pleased me well, and I took twelve men of you, one of, a, uh, one of a tribe. And they turned and went up into the mountain, and came to the valley of Eshcol, and searched it out. They took of the fruit of the land in their hands, and brought it down unto us, and brought us word again, and said, It is good land which the Lord thy God has given us. Notwithstanding, ye would not go up, but rebelled against the commandment of the Lord your God. And ye murmured in your tents, and said, Because the Lord hated us, he hath brought us forth out of the land of Egypt, to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites, to destroy us. See, again, they've got this negative attitude whither shall we go up our brethren have discouraged our hearts saying the people is greater and taller than we the cities are great and walled up to heaven and moreover we have seen the sons of Anakims there that's too bad you know you notice the English translation has got a Anakim is plural you don't need an S on it okay anyway then I said, you dread not, neither be afraid of them. The Lord your God which goeth before you, he shall fight for you according to all that he did for you in Egypt before your eyes and in the wilderness where thou hast seen how that the Lord thy God bare thee as a man doth bear his son in all the way that ye went until ye came unto this place. Yet in this thing ye did not believe the Lord your God who went in the way before you to search you out a place to pitch your tents in in fire by night and to show you by what way ye shall go and in a cloud by day. Remember what it says in the Psalms? Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and guess what? What's his commitment? He shall bring it to pass. Your job is to trust him, not trust, you know, trust him that he will do what he says he's going to do. If the Lord guides, he'll provide. And the Lord heard the voice of your words and was wroth. And swear, saying, Surely there shall not one of these men of this evil generation see that good land which I swear to give unto your fathers. Save Caleb, the son of Jehuna, he shall see it. To him will I give the land which he hath trod upon, and to his children, because he hath wholly followed the Lord. And Joshua also is included in that. Well, that, let's bring us to our last chapter, chapter 14. This is the sentence. They came to Kadesh Barnea, and they failed to believe God. So what did God do? Numbers 14, all the children lifted up their voice and cried. The people wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. And the whole congregation said to them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt? Or would God that we had died in this wilderness? Huh, you're going to get what you're hoping for, guys. Be, be careful what you wish for. Wherefore the Lord hath brought us unto this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be a prey. Were it not better for us to return unto Egypt? They said one to another, Let us make a captain, and let us return unto Egypt. There are passages that indicate they actually had one in mind. They actually elected some guy. They're ready to turn back. Can you imagine? Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. And Joshua the son of Nun, and Caleb the son of Jehuna, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes... And they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it is an exceeding good land. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us. 
a land which floweth with milk and honey. Only rebel not ye against the Lord. Neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. They're bred for us. The expression we might use is piece of cake, or it's duck soup. That's the, that's, this is the equivalent kind of expression here that he's using here, using our vernacular. Hebrews, chapters 3 and 4 are your commentary on this whole area. Book of Hebrews. But with whom he was grieved 40 years, was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? To whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not. So we see that they could not enter in. Why? Because of unbelief. And as we look at them in amazement, let's use that same look when we look in the mirror. How are we not also at our Kadesh Barnea? Every day. Do we believe them or don't we? I really believe the secret in life is to recognize that every day God finds another way to ask you the question, do you trust me? That's really what it's all about. Whether it's in your marriage, whether it's in your finances, whether it's in your family, whatever it is, God's interest is do you trust him? He's the issue. He's the issue. Continuing verse 10. But all the congregation bade stone them with stones. That's what Joshua and Caleb got for their commitment. They're, they're going to take up stones to stone them. And the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the ch children of Israel. That should get their attention. And the Lord said unto Moses, How long will this people provoke me? And how long will it be ere they believe me for all the signs which I have showed among them? Can you make the list? There's ten plagues that got them out of Egypt. There's been one miracle after another already, and we're just getting started. God continues, I will smite them with the pestilence and disinherit them. And I will make of thee, speaking to Moses, I will make of thee a greater nation and mightier than they. God is going to erase the blackboard and start over. He did it in Genesis 6. Now Moses, remember this was the guy that said, what did you give me this job for? Watch this performance. Moses said to the Lord, then the Egyptians will hear of it. For thou broughtest up this people in thy might from among them. And they will tell it to the inhabitants of this land. For they have heard that thou, Lord, art among this people, that thou, Lord, art seen face to face, and that thy cloud standeth over them, and that thou goest before them by daytime in a pillar of cloud. And the <laughs> Moses, Moses is trying to use psychology on God. You know, He's pointing out, hey, it's your reputation that's at stake here. Interesting, isn't it? Interesting line of thinking. That thou goest before them by daytime in a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire by night. Now, if thou shalt kill all this people as one man, then the nations which have heard the fame of thee will speak, saying, Because the Lord was not able to bring this people into the land which he sware unto them, therefore he hath slain them in the wilderness. I, I hear Moses talking to God. Like... <laughs> And now I beseech thee, let the power of my Lord be great according as thou hast spoken, saying, The Lord is long-suffering and of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, and by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children of the third and fourth generation. Pardon, I beseech the iniquity of this people according to the greatness of thy mercy. And as thou hast forgiven this people from Egypt even until now. Quite a Quite a speech. The Lord said, I have pardoned according to thy word. But, as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Because all these men, which have seen my glory and my miracles, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and have tempted me now these ten times, and have not hearkened to my voice, surely they shall not see the land which I swore unto their fathers. Neither shall any of them that provoke me to see it, uh, provoke me see it. Surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers. Neither shall any of them that provoke me see it. 
But my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit with him, and hath followed me fully, him will I bring unto the land wherein to he went, and his seed shall possess it. <clears throat> now verse 25, the translators put in parentheses. But if you understand the context here, there shouldn't be parentheses. It's a very central element in the picture. Now the Amalekites and Kenites dwelt in the valley. That's what they're going to be facing first. And we got tomorrow I'll turn you and get you into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. What God's saying, turn around. Don't go in the land now. Into the wilderness. That's what he's telling them. The Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation which murmur against me? I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel, which they murmur against me. Say unto them, As truly as I live, saith the Lord, as ye have spoken in mine ears, so will I do to you. Your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness. And all that were numbered of you, according to your whole number, from twenty years old and upward, which have murmured against me, doubtless ye shall not come into the land concerning which I swear to, you, to make you dwell therein, save Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and also Joshua, the son of Nun. Those are the two exceptions. But your little ones, which ye said should be a prey, them will I bring in, and they shall know the land which ye have despised. But as for you, your carcasses shall fall in the wilderness. And your children shall wander in the wilderness forty years, and bear your whoredoms until your carcasses be wasted in the wilderness. And the number of the days in which ye search the land, even forty days, each day for a year shall ye bear your iniquities, even forty years, and ye shall know my breach of promise. A day for a year. The same formula is used in Ezekiel chapter 4 for the 430 days that he deals with. It's the only place in Scripture that fits, but it does fit there. I, the Lord, have said, I will surely do it unto all this evil generation, that they are gathered together against me in this wilderness. They shall be consumed, and there they shall die. Now get this. And the men which Moses sent to search the land, who returned, and made all the congregation to murmur against him by bringing up a slander upon the land, in other words, what they said was a lie, even those men that did bring up the evil report upon the land died by the plague before the Lord. This is something you can easily miss in, in going through this. The congregation, 20 and older, would die before their 40 years are up. The 10 that were actually part of the search party died on the spot, apparently, before the Lord. So I think the Lord made his point. But Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jehunah, which were of the men that went to search the land, lived still. And Moses told these sayings unto all the children of Israel, and the people mourned greatly. And they rose up early in the morning and got them up to the top of the mountain, saying, Lo, we be here, and we will go up unto the place which the Lord hath promised, for we have sinned. See, they, they weren't paying attention. Now that they are sorry for that, they're going to go up against the, the enemies, and they're going to get clobbered. Moses said, Wherefore now do you transgress the command of the Lord, but it shall not prosper? Go not up, for the Lord is not among you, that ye be not smitten before your enemies. For the Amalekites and the Kenites are there before you, and ye shall fall by the sword, because ye have turned away from the Lord. Therefore the Lord will not be with you. But they presumed to go up to the hilltop. Nevertheless, the ark of the covenant of the Lord and Moses departed not out of the camp. Then the Amalekites came down and the Canaanites which dwelt in that hill and they smote them and discomfited them even unto Hormah. So that wraps up our lesson for tonight. Now we're going to go from here to the plains of Moab. And there's many lessons that they're going to learn along the way. But the main lesson tonight is are we, you and I, in our Kadesh Barnea? Are we in danger of the same kind of compromise or disbelief, whatever you want to call it, that condemned them to their 38 years. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer.